Hello everyone, I hope you're having a good day. My name is Kyle, and this is Web Dev Simplified, where we make the web easy to understand and accessible for everyone. In this video, I'm going to be going over everything that you need to know about SQL in order to do about 95% of the stuff that you'll ever need to do with SQL. It's going to be a long video because I have quite a bit to cover, so I'm going to start by talking about what SQL is and why it's important for you, and then for the majority of this video, I'm going to go over everything that you need to know about SQL, all of the syntax, all of the language, and everything that you're going to use when you're using SQL in your day-to-day -day life. And SQL is a lot like CSS in that it's very simple to understand and use and learn, but the complexity of actually using it and the different things you can do with it is what makes it difficult and hard to master. That's why I've included a list of exercises in the description. I have a GitHub repo that'll have a bunch of exercises with their solutions and the results so that you can work through those exercises after watching this video to get a better understanding of how SQL works and how to use it. Then coming up next week, I'm going to go over the solutions for all those different questions that I have in the repo. So make sure you stick around for the video next week as well, which will be linked at the end of this video if you're watching it after it's out. Also, I'm going to be creating additional videos relating to topics that are more difficult to understand as we go through this. So in the coming weeks and months, I'm going to have additional videos going over the more difficult topics of SQL. So let me know in the comments down below which topics you find the most confusing from this video so that I can make sure to dedicate extra time and videos to making those easier to understand for you. So without any further ado, let's get started. To get started, we first need to talk about what SQL is, and it's luckily fairly straightforward. SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language, is essentially just a language that's designed for creating, reading, updating, and deleting data from databases. And pretty much any relational database management system will use SQL as the baseline for how it accesses its data for creating, reading, updating, and deleting. So essentially, when you learn SQL, you're able to interact with pretty much any relational database management system using your SQL background and each relational database management system will handle higher level or lower level specific tasks that are used much less often in sometimes individual ways, but everything defined in SQL is universal between all of the different database management systems. And now, before we can actually jump into learning why SQL is so important, we first need to talk about and understand what a database is and kind of how they work a little bit. Essentially, a database is just a collection of data in separated out into different tables. And these tables are individual models of data. So you may have a user table, you may have a products table, you may have an orders table, and all these tables will be linking to each other in order to create connections between the different data. So then you have a table which contains data for a single model inside of your relation. And then inside of that table, you have different columns and different rows. The rows are the different records of your individual models. So if you have one user, that will equate to one record or row inside of your table, and two users would be two separate records or rows in that table. And then all of the properties of that user, such as their ID, name, email, password, those are all going to be columns inside of your database. And essentially, it's just a table with columns and rows that represent your different records and the different properties of those records. And then the different ways that the data is related to each other is how it becomes a relational database system where you can link data from different tables to data in other tables. And that's how you can create a complex data layout system using databases. They're fairly straightforward and essentially you just have to think about it as a collection of different tables that represent different objects inside of your data. Now, let's quickly talk about why it's important to learn SQL. It's fairly straightforward as to why it's so important. And that's because SQL deals with data and data is everywhere. Almost every application that you use, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on your computer, on the internet, it has some form of data that it needs to save somewhere. And databases, which use SQL, are one of the greatest and easiest ways to store data for any small scale or especially for large scale applications, which is why you see databases being used absolutely everywhere across development in any form. And this is why it's so crucial to learn SQL because as a developer, no matter what you work on, you will eventually encounter SQL and have to work with databases and knowing SQL at a strong level will help you significantly in your development career. Now that we understand why SQL is so important and what SQL is, let's jump into my SQL workbench in order to demonstrate the syntax of SQL and then talk about the different commands that we can use with SQL in order to create, read, update, and delete our data. 
If you haven't already downloaded MySQL Workbench, I recommend checking out my last video, which I'll link up in the top corner and in the description below, that'll tell you how to download MySQL Server and MySQL Workbench on your computer in order to follow along. I now have MySQL Workbench open and connected to my local MySQL Server, but I don't have any files open for me to be able to run SQL commands. In order to do that, I need to click this icon in the top left corner here that allow me to create a new SQL tab for executing queries. When I click on that, it'll open up a file for me that I can start writing SQL inside of. So now let's talk a little bit about the SQL syntax, which is luckily really straightforward to understand. There are different keywords in SQL, such as the keyword select, where, from, and all of these different keywords, they'll highlight in blue most likely for you if you're using MySQL Workbench. And if you're using some form of other editor, they're going to highlight in a specific color so that you can distinguish your keywords from your non-keywords. And these keywords are not at all case sensitive. So for example, this select that I have here, I could write it like this, select. I could write it all lowercase. I could write it with capital letters just randomly thrown throughout it. It doesn't matter. As long as you write the word select, it is going to work as your select keyword for SQL. And SQL is using a combination of keywords table names and column names in order to string together a different query. So for example, we could just say select from, and then you put the table name that you want to select from, and select the column here. And essentially this is a SQL command. They have a bunch of different keywords. You have different table names, different column names. And then at the end of your SQL command, you need to put a semicolon. Now this is not required in every single database management system. But if you wanted to write two different SQL queries in one file, you need semicolons to separate them. So I recommend always ending a semicolon to the end of your SQL statement, no matter what you're doing. Also, even though the keywords can be written in all caps, all lowercase, or any other combination of uppercase or lowercase, it is almost always best practice and the standard to write all of your keywords in full uppercase in order to distinguish them from your column names and table names which will most likely be in lowercase format as opposed to uppercase. Also, if you need to write a string inside of SQL, you use single quotes and then put the string inside of those single quotes to distinguish that you have a string instead of some form of keyword or some form of table or column name. So now that we have that out of the way, let's get started with actually creating a database for us to use. In this example, I'm going to create a database for a record company, which will have bands, albums, and songs inside of it for you to be able to work with. Now that we've got the syntax out of the way, we're going to create a database for a record company, which is going to contain tables for bands and albums. So to get started, we need to create this database because we don't actually have any databases in our SQL server that we've created yet. So let's remove all of this and we're going to write the create database command. This command is super straightforward. You just write the words create and then database and then the name of the database that you want to create. And in our case, we're just going to create a database called test. So we just put test, end it with a semicolon. And then inside of MySQL server, there's two different ways that you can run a command. There's this lightning bolt icon on the left here that just executes absolutely everything inside of this file over here, or it'll execute whatever you highlight. So if you wanna just execute a few commands, you can highlight them and then click this exclam lightning bolt in order to execute them. Or there's the second option, which is this lightning bolt with the cursor, and that'll just execute whatever statement your cursor is inside of, which is the method I usually use for running SQL commands inside of SQL Server. So if we just click on this icon right here, we'll create a database called test, and you'll notice nothing actually happens. It doesn't look like anything is created, and that's because MySQL Workbench doesn't actually update the UI when you create new things very quickly. So if you go over to the schemas section, this is just where your databases are listed. If you click refresh, it'll actually populate our database down here of test. And if we open that up, you see that we have an empty test database with no tables or anything else inside of it. And that's exactly what we want since we used create database to create that database. But since we're not creating a database called test, we actually want our database to be about something else. Let's remove this database. To do that, we're going to use the drop database command. And then we just put the name of the database again that we want to drop afterwards, which is test in our case end it with a semicolon. And if we run that statement, you see that over here on the left, our test database has been removed. And if you refresh it, you see it won't pop back up. And that's because we've dropped that database, all of the tables inside of it, and all of the data inside of it. And now this is something that you are almost never going to use because dropping a database 
deletes all of the data inside of that database. And once you have your data in your database, you almost never want to completely destroy it. So this is a command that you'll almost never use, but it's good to know that it exists in case you accidentally create a database that you don't actually want. In our case, that's exactly what we did. So now let's create the actual database that we want, which as I mentioned earlier, is going to be for a record company. So create database, put the name of our database, which is going to be record company in here. And if we run that and refresh down here, you now see that we have our record company database and we can start adding tables to this database and start adding data into those tables. Now, in order to make it so that our SQL queries that we're running over here in our file actually run against the database that we just created, we need to tell SQL that we are going to use that database. And to do that, we just use the use command. So we type in use and then the name of the database that we want to run our queries on. So in this case, we just want to run them on the record company database that we just created. And if we just hit that to execute, we are now using the record company database and you see that it is bolded over here in MySQL workbench, which tells us that we are now using that database. So when we run commands such as creating tables or adding data, it'll add it and create it on the record company database. Otherwise, it won't actually know what database we want to run these commands on. So now we can work on creating our first table. This is going to be done in a very similar fashion to how create database was done. But instead of using database, we're just going to use create table and then the name of the table that we want to create. So we're just going to do a test table to start here. And now, as I mentioned earlier, tables have columns inside of them that represent the different properties of the object that it's representing. So when we create our table, we need to tell it what columns we want it to create with. So we create parentheses and inside of these parentheses, we're going to put the different columns that we want for our table. So for example, in this table, we're just going to add one column, I'm just going to call it test column. And then we need to give that column a type because our database needs to know what type of data it's storing. For example, is it going to be a string? Is it an integer? Is it a date, a floating point number? We need to tell our database what type of data that holds. So in our case, we'll just use int. And again, since this is a keyword, I like to keep it all uppercase in order to distinguish it from my column names and table names. And we don't need to end any of this with a semicolon because all of this three lines right here is a single SQL command. So we just want to put the SQL, the semicolon at the end of that command. And this inside of here is not actually a command. So we don't want to end it with a semicolon. Otherwise we're going to get an error. So now if we put our cursor inside of this command, click to execute it. And if we refresh our schema over here on the left, you'll see that we now have a little drop down by our tables and we have a test table. And inside of that table in our columns, we have our test column, which is a type of integer. And that's awesome. But let's say we want to add another column to our table. We forgot to add it in the beginning and we don't want to go back and change this create table because we already have data in there. And if we recreate the table, we're going to lose that data. So we have a command called alter table, which will allow us to change properties of our table after we create it. So we just type in alter table and then the name of the table that we want to alter from our example, it's going to be the test table. And then we tell it what we want to do. So we're going to tell what we want to add and we want to add a column. So we're going to put the column name here. We're just going to call it another column. And then we say what type we want that column to be. And in our case, we're going to use a string, which in SQL, there's many different ways to determine a string, but the easiest way is using a varchar, which essentially says this is a variable length character array, which is essentially just what a string is. And then we need to tell the varchar the maximum length that it can be. So in our case, we'll just say 255 is the maximum length that our string will be. So this will create a string column with a max length of 255 that is going to be named another column. And then we'll end that with a semicolon. And you'll notice that I've created a line break in here. I added this onto another line and SQL actually doesn't care about line breaks in the statement. It just reads it until it sees the semicolon. So I could put as many line breaks in here as I wanted to, and it would still work just fine even if I had it on multiple lines or all on one line. So now if we run that, refresh our schema, you'll see that we now have that another column added to our columns of our test database. And that's great. We now know how to create database tables and we know how to add columns to those tables after we've created them. And that's perfect. So now since we have this test table and we don't actually want it, let's look at dropping that table, which works exactly the same as dropping a database.
we just go in here, type in drop table and the name of the table. And if we run that, you'll see that our test table completely removes itself from the table section in the schema of the record company. Now that we've removed that table that we don't actually want, let's work on adding a table for a band that we're going to use inside of our record company database since we want to represent different bands for our record company. So let's write create table and we're going to call our table bands because it's going to just hold all of our bands. Again, we want our parentheses in order to say what our columns are going to be inside of here. And in our case, our bands are just going to have a name. That's all we really care about is the name of the band. So we'll use name as our column name. Again, we want this to be a var char and we'll just say 255 again for the length. And we never want a band to not have a name. So to make sure our band always has a name, we're going to add not null to our column. So we just put not null here. And this says that our column can no longer have any null values inside of it, which means it must always have a name defined. And this is a great way in order to force your table to have different values defined, and it'll throw an error if you try to insert a band that does not have a name. And now you may think that that's all we need to do to create a band, but what if a band has the same name as another band? That can happen. How do we distinguish these two bands from each other? And that's where using an ID column comes in handy. In almost every table that you create inside of a database, you're going to want to add an ID column in order to uniquely identify that row in that table from all of the other rows inside that table. So up here, let's just add a column, we'll call it ID. We want this to just be an integer because that's an easy way to distinguish different things. It can be one, two, three, four, and we easily can distinguish them from one another. We never want this to be null, again, just like the name. And since this ID is something that is going to distinguish our records, we don't actually want to add this ID when we insert records. We want it to be automatically generated whenever we add a new band to our table. So we're going to give it the auto increment property. And this just tells the table that we want to automatically increment this ID every time we add a new band. So the first band will be one, the second band will be two and three and four and so on. And it will constantly auto increment this number for us without us having to do anything. And one last thing that we need to do, we need to add a column in between our ID and name column so that SQL knows that these are two separate columns and we use that comma to separate them, just like we use semi commas, semicolons, sorry, in order to separate our different SQL commands inside of our file. And lastly, since this ID is going to be the identifier of our table, it is what's called a primary key. And a primary key is the primary identifying column for that table. And that's what's used to say that this is unique and it is going to be what identifies an individual record inside of a table. So we want to tell SQL that our ID column is our primary key. So down here, we're going to use the primary key keyword in order to define a primary key. And then inside of parentheses, we put what our primary key is. And in our case, it is the ID column. Now, if we run this command and refresh our schema, you'll see that we now have the bands table. Inside of that bands table, we have these different columns. And you'll also see that we have an index for our primary key which tells SQL that this is what distinguishes our band from the other band records inside of our table, which allows it to do quick queries. If we give it an ID, it'll be much quicker than if we query on say the name column inside of our band table. While we're on the case of creating tables, let's create the album table that's going to contain the different albums for our different bands inside of our database. So we can just use create table again. We'll call this table albums since it will contain our albums. And then inside of here, we're going to put our parentheses, put the semicolon at the end of it. And now we want to define our different columns. Our first column, again, we're going to have that ID column to uniquely identify our different albums. So we'll say ID, make it an integer, not null again, since we don't want this to ever be empty, and auto increment lastly, so that it'll automatically take care of incrementing this number as we add new albums. Next, we want our album to have a name again. So this is going to look very similar to our band at the top. We want to create a var car. We're going to make it 255, just since it's the same as everything else. And again, we don't want this to ever be empty. So we'll say not null so that every album will have a name. And the last thing that our albums are going to have is we want to know when they were released. So we're going to add a release year onto our albums. We'll just add this release year column. We'll make it an integer 
And we don't care if this is null because maybe we don't know when the album's going to release, or maybe it hasn't been announced when this album will release, so we want this to stay null, so we won't put not null on here. And then we need to be able to connect an album to a band, but we can't just put a band column inside of here and we can't put all the band information inside of the album. We need to reference the band table from inside of our album table. And that's where this ID that we created up here comes in handy because now we can save that ID in the albums table and that'll allow us to reference the bands table from within the albums table. So in here, let's add a band ID column, which is what is going to have the ID of the band that this album is for. So this is going to be an integer because it's the same as this ID up here. And we wanna make sure that it's not null because we don't ever want an album to not have a band since every album needs to be composed by some band. And then we need to define our primary key just as we did above. So we'll put primary key and then ID since the ID is our primary key for the album table as well. And then the very last thing that we need to do is this band ID is referencing this band's table, which is referred to as a foreign key, which is any form of key that references a table other than itself. So albums has the primary key because that is the key defining the album records from each other, the uniqueness. And band ID is referencing the bands table. So that is a foreign key referencing a foreign table. So we need to define that relationship between the band ID and the band table. To do this, we're going to use the foreign key property. And then inside of parentheses, we want to put what our foreign key is, which is band ID. So this is so far very similar to primary key, but we need to tell our foreign key what table it references. So we're gonna say that it references the band table and then we need to tell it what column it is referencing and it is referencing the ID column inside of that band table. And now we have our foreign key set up between our albums and our bands so that SQL will no longer let us create an album if we give it a band ID that doesn't already exist in the band table. Also, if we try to delete a band that has albums linking to that band, it'll throw an error saying that you have a, albums that exist for this band, so you can't delete the band unless you also delete the albums that go with that band. So before we run this, I need to fix one error that I made, and that is where we're referencing our table, we called our table bands, so we need to make sure that we reference that table exactly by name where it should be bands instead of band, which I had accidentally written. And now if we run this code, You'll see that if we come over to our tables and we refresh, we're now going to have this albums table and inside of this album table, inside of our foreign keys, you'll see that we have a foreign key linking our albums to our band table. We also have all of the columns that we've created and the index for our primary key and band ID, which allows us to do quick searches for these different columns inside of our database. Now that we've finally gotten all of the tables that we needed created, we can actually start working on adding data to our tables and querying that table from our tables because that's really what SQL is for, is for adding data and reading that data. So let's get started by inserting some bands inside of our band table. Let's go down here a little way so we have a little bit of space. And what we wanna do is we wanna insert into the bands table and we wanna supply the different values for the bands that we want to insert. So we're gonna use the insert into command and then you put the table name you wanna insert data into and in our case, that is going to be the bands table. And then after that, you need to put all of the different columns that you want to insert into inside of parentheses. And in our case, we only have one column, which is the name column inside of our band table. As I mentioned earlier, the ID column inside of our band table automatically generates itself. So we don't actually need to enter this when we add data into our table. So we insert into our bands, we're going to insert a name, and then we need to put the different values that we want to insert. So we use the values keyword. And then after that, in parentheses, we're going to put the name of the band since that corresponds with this name column that we defined. So let's just add Iron Maiden to our database, add the semicolon at the end. And if we run this command, you'll see that nothing happens, but we've actually added that band into our database. So let's add a few more bands into our database and then start querying these different bands. So another way to insert data into the database is we're going to use this insert into command again, and then put the band name or the table name, sorry, which is bands, the columns again, values, 
And then if we want to put more than one entry inside of our table at the same time, instead of having to rewrite all of the different inserts into bands, name, all that stuff over and over, all we have to do is put the different columns that we want. So in here, let's say we want to enter the band deuce. And then if we wanted to enter another band, all we do is put a comma. And then inside of more parentheses, we put the columns values for the next entry. So we'll put in Avenge Sevenfold. And then lastly, we'll put in the band anchor, put the semicolon at the end. And now if we run this statement, it'll add three different bands to our band table and it'll give all of them a unique ID that'll be auto incremented on its own. So if we run that command, and now we have all four of those bands inside of our bands table, and we can actually start querying the data from our table. So to query the data from our table, we're going to use the select command. So you just write out select. And then the second thing that you want to write is the different columns that you want to select. But if you want to select every column, all you need to do is put a star and that'll select every single column that you're querying. And then we need to tell it what table we want to query from. So we want to query from the bands table. Now, if we just end that with a semicolon and execute that, you'll see that we did our different results. You see that we have our ID column, our name column, and then the four names that we entered, as well as four unique IDs that were automatically generated by the database from our auto increment up above that we created when we created our table. And that's great. But what if, for example, we only wanted to get two bands back instead of all of the different bands? To do that, we would just do this select exactly the same as before. We're going to select from bands, but we need to tell it a limit. So we just say limit, and let's say we just want two bands. So this is going to just get us the first two bands from our query. And if we run that, you now see that we just get Iron Maiden and Deuce, which are the first two bands returned by this query. We can also get just certain columns instead of getting all the columns. So to do that, we're going to do the same thing, but instead of putting a star here, we're just going to put the name of the column we want to get, which in our case, we just want the name column. So we'll say select name from bands. And if we run that, we now just get the name column being returned and we are no longer getting the ID column from the bands table. Another nice thing that you can do is you can actually rename the columns in order to be easier to be read or used inside of your program. So let's write up our select statement again. And let's say we want to select the ID but we want to change the name of how our ID looks. So we'll say as to alias the name as something else. And we'll say we want it to be returned as ID all uppercase. And then we can do the same thing for the name. So if you want to select multiple columns, just put a comma between them. We'll say we want the name column and we want this to be written as band name. And then we just say, we're going to get them from bands and we'll end that with a semicolon. And if we run that, you'll see that the titles for our different columns have changed to be the same as what we wrote in the as here for our aliases of our column names. These aliases are really useful because you can also reference what you alias later in your execution, which we'll see when we start talking about more complex uses of the select statement as well as other statements in SQL. The last thing that I wanna talk about with the select statement before we move on is that you can actually order the way the elements inside of your select statement are rendered. So let's write another select here. We're just going to select everything from the bands table again. And then let's say we want to order them by the name. We can just say order by, and then we write what we want to order them by. And in our case, we just want to order by the name column. So if we run this, you'll see that now, instead of being ordered by ID, they're ordered in alphabetical order of the name that we supplied. But if we wanted to reverse that order, we could just do it in descending order instead of ascending order. So we write descending at the end here, run this, and now they're in reverse alphabetical order. And by default, descending is set to ascending, which is what gave us the alphabetical order the first time. But if you just leave this off, it'll just default to ascending order, which is what we had originally done. And as you can see, when we run that, it orders them in ascending order, which is what this order by property is great at doing. So now that we've learned about many of the different ways that we can select data from our table, let's add in some albums to our albums table down below. So we need to use our insert into, as we've talked about earlier, put the title of the table that we want to insert into, which is albums, and then all of the different columns that we want to insert into. So we want to insert into the name column, the release year column, 
and the band ID so that we can link the ID of the album to a specific band that wrote that album. And then we want all the different values that we want to insert. And we're going to insert a bunch of different elements into our albums table in this one statement. So in parentheses here, we see that our first column is the name column. So we're going to put the name of our album, which is going to be the number of the beast. And then we're going to put the release year of that album, which is going to be 1985. And then the ID of the band that wrote that album, so Iron Maiden wrote that album, their ID is one. So we're going to put a one here as the ID of the band. And then we'll put a comma. We'll go down to the next line just to make this easier to read. And we'll add in our next statement, which is going to be another album by Iron Maiden called Power Slave. Release year of that, 1984. And again, a band ID of one. And we can enter another album. This one is going to be Nightmare, released in 2018. And this is by Deuce, so we're going to use the ID of two here, which corresponds with Deuce for the band. And again, another album, which is also called Nightmare. This one released in 2010. And this one's by Avenged Sevenfold, so we're going to use the ID of three. And then lastly, we're going to add one last album. This one we're just going to call test album. It's not going to have a release date because we don't know when this is actually released. And we're going to say that this was an album put out by Avenged Sevenfold and end that with a semicolon. And now if we run this, we've actually added all those different albums to our albums table and we can select them just by using the select statement that we talked about earlier. So we can say select star from albums and if we run that, you see that we have all of our different albums being returned down here with their release year and the band ID that they correspond with. And if you look at test album, you'll see that this is null for the release year because it doesn't actually have a year that released since we didn't actually supply a year, which is exactly what we want. As I talked about earlier, we can select just the name from our albums table. So we can say select name from albums. And if we run this, we're going to get all the names of the different albums inside of our database you'll notice that Nightmare shows up twice because that album, there's actually two Nightmare albums inside of our database. But for this query, we just, for example, want to get the name of all the albums in our database, but we only want the unique names. We don't want to get the same name back twice. So in order to get only unique rows from our database, we just put distinct inside of our select query here. And if we run that, you'll see that now we only get the names that are unique inside of our database. And this distinct line, all it does is say everything that gets returned, which in our case is just a name, it compares them. And if any of them are the same, it just removes all of them except for one. So you only get one unique row for every single item inside of your database, instead of getting duplicates. If for example, in our case, we have two nightmare albums, it'll now only return one, which is exactly what we want in this case. And now if any of you are Iron Maiden fans, you may have noticed that I actually put in the wrong release year for the number of the beast album which I did on purpose, I promise you. I'm not terrible with knowing the years. And in order to change that, we need to use the update query inside of SQL. So if we come down here, just write update, and we need to put the table name that we want to update. So in our case, we want to update the albums table. And then we need to tell our table what we want to update. So we're going to say we want to set the release year. And in our case, the release year for this album should be 1982 instead of 1985. And then if we just run this right now, this will update every single album inside of our table to have the release year of 1982, which is definitely not what we want. All we want to do is update the release year of a single record inside of our table. So let's query all of our albums again by selecting this row up here. And we can see that this album has an ID of one that we want to change the release year to 1982 instead of 1985. So if we scroll down here, we can use what is called the where statement, which can be added to almost every SQL query in order to filter down the actual results being returned. So we can say where we put what we want to query on. So we'll use the ID column and we want to say where the ID equals one, we want to do this query. So we want to update the albums table by setting the release year to 1982 for every record where the ID equals one, which will just be one single record in our case. And now if we run this, you'll notice it looks like nothing happens. But if we query our albums table again, 
you'll see that the number of the beast release year has been updated to 1982 from the original 1985 that we inserted into our table. This update method is incredibly useful for whenever your data changes inside of your database, which is something that is going to happen all the time inside of an application. As I mentioned, this where statement can be added to the end of multiple different statements and one of the cases where it's used all the time is when you want to filter what you're selecting from the database. In our case, we've just been selecting every row in the table, but this is normally not what you want to do. What if you want to just select all of the albums that were released before the year 2000? We could write our select statement. We'll just select all of the columns from our table albums, and then we just say our where statement. So we can say where the release year, in our case, we want the release year to be before 2000, so we'll just say less than 2000. And if we run this, you'll see that it only returns albums with a release year that occurred before the year 2000. And the WHERE clause has so many different ways that you can filter by, and it's incredibly useful. Another way that we can filter is we can filter on the string by using wildcards to filter where the string contains certain parts of it. So let me just write this up because it's much easier to explain by looking at it rather than me trying to talk about it. So we'll select from the albums table where the name, and we want to say where it is like, so it's just going to be similar to the string that we give it. So where the name is like, and then inside of these quotes, whatever we put is what it's going to compare the string to. So if we put a percent sign, that says that everything inside of this percent area can be absolutely anything. It can be either no characters, as many characters as you want, it doesn't matter. So let's put percent er and then another percent sign. So this says we want any amount of characters anywhere before this and then the letters er somewhere in order inside of the string and then any amount of characters after that inside of our string. Put the semicolon at the end and we'll run that and you'll see that we get the results for the number of the beast and power slave. And that's because if you look at their name, they have er inside of their name somewhere and some amount of characters before it, and some amount of characters after it, which is what these 2% signs are equal to. It can be a little bit confusing how that percent sign works, but essentially just think about it as it can be anything. It doesn't really matter. So really, this is just checking if there's ER somewhere inside of the string. And you can also combine different where clauses inside of your single query. So in our case, if we wanted to select where the name has ER inside of it, or where the band ID is equal to two, we could just say, or band ID equals two. And now this will check for this clause right here, or this clause over here and return both of those sets of results. So if we run this, you'll see that we get both of our ER results up here and we get the nightmare album because that's released by band number two based on this band ID two, which we queried on up here in the or clause. We could also make and be a different one. So if we wanted to select from our albums again, and we wanted to say where the release year is equal to 1984, and we want to make it so it's only for band ID one. And if we run this, it'll check for the release year of 1984 and a band ID of one, and it'll only return rows that have both of these statements working. So if we run that, you'll see that we get the Power Slave album because it has a release year of 1984 and it was put out by band number one. Now there are just two more quick ways that I wanna talk about how the where statement can be used. And that is if you wanted to filter between two different values. So if we wanna select from the albums and we wanna filter where the release year, sorry, release year. And we wanna say where the release year is between two different numbers. So we want to get all of the albums between 2000 and 2018. So we just use the between keyword. We put the beginning value, the minimum value, and, and then we put the maximum value that we want to filter between. And if we run this, you see we get only albums released between 2000 and 2018. And the last thing that we can do with the where statement is we can filter for things that are null. So in our case, we can say where the release year is null. And this will return to us all of the records inside of our albums table that don't have a release year set. And if we run this, you see that we get this test album back because it's the only album in our database that has no release year set for it.
And we don't really want this test album because this was a mistake. We didn't actually want this data. We should probably remove this data. So we can use the delete command, which we just write by doing delete from, which is very similar to our select from. And we put the table name, which in our case is albums. And then if we run this right now, it'll delete every single row from our albums table, which we definitely do not want to do. So we need to add a where clause to tell it where we want to delete. So in our case, we're just going to say where ID is equal to five, since that is the ID of our test album, as we can see down here. And if we run this, you'll see nothing actually looks like it happens. But if we try to just select all of our albums, let's do that real quick. We select all of our albums and run that. You'll see that that fifth ID is no longer here because we deleted it from our database. Now with that last statement of delete from being written, we've talked about the four main ways that SQL is used to interact with data by creating it, reading it, updating it, and deleting it. And this is really the cornerstone to everything that you need to do with SQL. But there's quite a few more really unique and really powerful features that you're going to use all the time in SQL that I wanna talk about. And the first one is the join statement, which allows us to join two different tables together on different properties. So in our case, we created this band ID column, so we can join our band ID to our band table in order to query the different albums for our different bands or the different bands for our different albums. And it really allows us to create powerful queries that allow us to create relations between our data inside of our database, which is what makes SQL so powerful. So let's get started by just doing the most basic join statement on our different albums and bands. So if we go down here, we just need to do a basic select to start. So we say we want to select everything from the bands table. And then we tell the bands table that we want to join it on the albums table. So we'll say join followed by the name of the table we want to join on, which is the albums table. And then we need to tell SQL how we want to join these tables because all join does is check a query to say, are these things equal essentially? So we say we want to query the albums table on when the bands dot id so we are querying this table and then we want to get the id column from that table so we're just getting the id of our band and we want to check when it's equal to the band id from our albums table so we're saying the albums table column band id and we're just comparing the different values inside of these rows together to see when they are equal we want to select them from our bands and our albums we put a semicolon and run that you'll see that we get all of our band information being returned, as well as all of our album information being returned for all of the bands that have albums inside of our database. And as you can see, this band ID is equal to the band ID in the albums table for all of our different records inside of our table, as you can see, which is exactly what join is doing. It is just joining those two together on the band ID column and the ID column of the bands table. And then it's just outputting the band information and the album information because when we say in select star, it's selecting everything from the bands table and the albums table. You'll also notice that the Iron Maiden row is actually duplicated here, and that's because it has two different albums associated to that single band. So it's listing the band twice, and then the albums for each one over in the section where the album is listed. And there's multiple different ways that you can join in SQL. Three specifically for MySQL, and that is using inner join, which is exactly what the basic join does. So you can either write inner join like this or this join. And if we run that, you'll see that we get the exact same results. There's also left join and right join. So an easy way to understand how these different joins work is an inner join combines data where there is both a value on the table on the left, which in our case is the bands table. It's whatever table you write first as the table is on the left. And the table on the right is the albums table, which is the table you're joining onto. It only returns values that have a match. So if, for example, the ID is in the table here on the left and the ID is in the table on the right. Left join will allow us to have all of the bands that don't have any albums will also show up because left join lists everything from the left side, which is the first table you list in the from here, the bands table. It'll list all of those tables, even if they don't have a match in albums. So let's copy this here and do a left join instead of an inner join. So if we change inner to be left and we run that, you'll see that we now get this fifth result down here for the anchor band, 
and you'll see that there's actually no albums associated with this band at all, but it's being returned because we're doing a left join, which joins with this from statement right here, and it's saying, even if there is nothing for it, it's okay because we're left joining, so we're returning everything on the left side, no matter what. And then if we wanted to do a right join, it'll join on the right side. So if there is an album with no band associated, it would still return that album. But in our case, as you can see, there are no albums that don't have any bands. So in order to make it look like this right join is working, if we swap albums up to here and bands down to here, now the right side of our table is this bands table. And if we run this, you'll see that now we get this anchor band here again because it's on the right side of our query since it's on the join statement. And even though it has nothing on the left side, which is this album section, it's still being returned because we're doing a right join instead of doing a left join or an inner join. So for the most part, you're only going to use inner joins and left joins because right joins are essentially the same thing as left join, just flipped, which makes it a little bit more confusing to reason with in your mind. So inner joins are really useful when you only want to get records back when there is both a value in the table on the left, which you're selecting from, and the table on the right, which you're joining to. And left joins are really useful when you just want to get absolutely everything from the left side table, which you're selecting from, and then just get the things from the right side table if they exist, and if they don't, still return the thing from the left side, even if it doesn't have anything on the right side. These are two very common queries that you're going to use all the time in SQL, because the point of using a relational database system is so you can have relations in your database. It's literally in the name, and that's what these join statements allow you to do, is to be able to query data based on these different relations. Now we're finally on to the very last topic that I want to talk about in this video, which is aggregate functions and grouping by in your different SQL statements. Let's first start by talking about aggregate functions because they're very straightforward to understand. Let's go down here a little ways and we're just going to create a select. And instead of selecting an individual column from our table, we're going to use an aggregate function in order to select an aggregate of our data so we want to select the average, so we'll use average here, AVG, and inside of here, we're going to place the column name that we want to average over. So we'll average the release year because we want to figure out what the average release year of all the data in our database is to figure out if we like new music or old music. So we'll select from albums. And if we run this, you'll notice we just get one single row returned to us because it's averaging all of the rows inside of our albums table and returning the average release year, which in our case is 1998.5. So this aggregate just takes all the data returned from the select and then runs a function on it. In this case, we're using the average function, but there's many other functions such as sum. If we wanted to add all the release years for some reason, we could run that and you see that we get 7,994. And there's tons of different aggregate functions, but some of the most useful ones are average, sum, and count. So now let's take a look at a situation where count would be incredibly useful. And this is if we want to use the group by as well. So we're going to use our select here and we're going to select the band ID and we're going to select the count of the band ID from our albums table. Because what we want to do is we want to get all of the bands and we want to figure out how many albums each of these bands have. But in order to do that, we need to group by that band ID because as we know inside of our albums table, if a band has two albums, there'll be two records inside of that table that have the exact same band ID. And what group by does is it takes all of the records and groups them by a single column inside of that table. So in our case, it's the band ID. So we're going to take all the rows with the same band ID and squish them into one single row. And then this aggregate function will run over those different groups of our rows. So we just need to put group by to tell us what we want to group by. And we put the column, which in our case is band ID. And if we run this, you'll see that for band ID one, we have two records inside the albums table. Band ID two, we have one. And band ID three, we also have one. And the reason that this aggregate function here is returning multiple rows instead of just one, like it did up here, is because aggregates work on the actual group as a whole instead of the whole entire query. And since we're grouping by band ID, we have three unique band IDs. So we have three separate groups that our count is executing itself upon.
If that doesn't make sense, we have a few more examples that I'm going to go over where we can look at a little bit more in depth on how we can combine group by and joins in order to make some really complex and really useful queries inside of SQL. Also, inside of the exercises that I have listed in the repository below, there's lots of different examples that will slowly step you up into creating complex group by and join statements, which will be really useful in helping you figure out and learn exactly how these group bys work because they are, in my opinion, the most complicated part of learning SQL. So this last query that I have, all it's going to do is it's going to take what we have already created up here, and it's going to give us a little bit more meaningful information because band ID one, looking at this, doesn't mean anything. What is band ID one? What band is that? I wanna know what band that is instead of just looking at an ID. So we need to join this table on the band table in order to give us information about the band. So the first thing that we wanna do is essentially copy what we've already created, but we wanna select the band.name and you'll see in a little bit why I'm using B instead of the actual table name. So we'll say B.name and we wanna return this as band name. And we also want to get the count of the different albums because that's essentially what this query is doing up here. So we're going to use count, we'll do A.ID and again, I'll explain why I'm doing this in a little bit. And we'll return this as the number of albums instead. And then we wanna select this from the band table. So we'll say from bands. And we're also going to alias bands. So we can say as B. And now instead of having to put bands everywhere, we can just put B like I did up here, B.name. And this B will reference this bands table, which allows us to easily shorthand this bands table to make writing our queries a little bit more simple. Then we're going to do a left join because in this case, we want to get the bands even if they don't have any albums because we'll just return zero as the number of albums that that band has. So we'll do a left join on the albums and we'll call albums A so that we can reference it as A as I did up here. And then we'll just say we wanna join it on the bands table ID is equal to the albums table band ID. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to group by that band ID again in order to get those different aggregates that we can aggregate over. So we'll say group by band.id. And if we run this, you'll see that Iron Maiden has two albums, Deuce has one album, Avenged Sevenfold has one, and then Anchor has zero albums. And this works very similarly to all these statements that we've talked about up here, but we've grouped it all into one. So I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit to make it a little bit easier to understand. So the first thing we've done is talked about the columns we want to select and we've aliased them so that they're easier to see down here as band name and number of albums, as opposed to you know, b.name and count a.id. That really doesn't tell us anything. So that's why we've aliased these different column names. We've also done a join on the albums table with the left join, which means that we're even getting the bands that have no album records as we did up here. If I run this right here, you'll see we're getting the bands that even don't have any album records, which is what we want when we run this query down here because when we do the count of the album IDs, we'll just get zero, which you can see happened for Anchor right here. And then lastly, we're grouping these by the band ID so that we can have unique rows for the different band IDs and all that gets squished together. But since the name is exactly the same where the ID is the same, that's why we can select this band name up here. And the count of the album ID is what's going to tell us how many unique albums there are inside of that different grouping by band ID. And that's how we're able to get these different columns for the band names and the number of albums. And I understand that this is quite confusing and it really just takes working through different problems to fully understand this. It's really hard to explain and hear about. So that's why I've included those exercises that I highly recommend you look at. The last thing that I wanna talk about is what if we want to filter by the aggregate? We wanna filter by the number of albums because we only wanna return bands that have one single album. So you would think all we do is just put a where in here and we'd say where the number of albums is equal to one. But this won't actually work because where statements happen before the group by. So we can't actually query by the number of albums because this aggregate happens after the group by. So in SQL, we have to use what is called the having statement. And having is exactly the same as where, but it happens after the group by. So you can use aggregate function data instead of having. So in here, 
we can put the number of albums, set it equal to one, and now if we query this, you'll see that we only get the bands that have exactly one album, and we were able to use this number of albums alias because we defined it up here as the count of a.id. So that's exactly how we want to query on aggregate data. It has to happen inside of a having, which has to be after the group by. And if we still want to use where, we can do that by just saying where, we can check where the name, for example, is equal to deuce. And if we query that, we now are only getting bands that have the name of deuce and that have more than one album, which is exactly what we want. And as you can see, we get that in one record down here, which is perfect. Now, as I mentioned, this is very complicated to wrap your head around. So if you don't fully get it, don't be discouraged. Go down in the description, check out that repository, and go through the different examples I have in there. They start out really simple, where you're just selecting basic data and inserting basic data, and it'll get more and more complex until you work your way all the way up to creating large queries like this to query complex join and group by data from the different tables. So I highly recommend you check that out and let me know what you think. I'm going to be creating solution video for all the different problems inside of that worksheet coming out next week, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And that's all I have to talk about when it comes to SQL. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like down below and subscribe for more similar content just like this coming in the future. Thank you guys very much for watching and have a good day.